Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I'm going to read just sort of a formal notice to document um, the meeting we're having here. So I am going to just read from the comments. And then the plan is that we do have a presentation that we'd like to go through to give you some ideas of what we've been working on. Uh, we've broken it in so that each person will be making a presentation. Uh, some of you have seen it before, but um, it hasn't really changed. So let me get underway here. So welcome and thank you for coming tonight. And thank you to all that have attended earlier, written and have written or otherwise contributed comments and suggestions in previous planning commission meetings. The commission has been engaged in the process of renewing the bylaws for several years from determining a process to tackle and modernize them to then moving through that methodology in a thoughtful and reasonable manner. It has involved countless hours of volunteer time. Along the way, the Planning Commission has experienced changes in commissioners and changes in town staffing, all of which have contributed to a broader set of ideas. These commissioners here tonight bring a plethora of experiences, residency in our town, land use planning expertise, GIS technology backgrounds, and expertise uh, <laughs> to the thoughtful recommendations of this uh, unified development bylaw document. These regulations are not final. Our goal here tonight is to continue taking public input on the proposed regulations and bylaws and to use that input to make the changes that in our judgment are appropriate. In fairness to the commission, we need to discuss your input before we make those decisions. So we ask that we will, so don't expect us to answer your questions or be revising the draft tonight. We're gonna to take the information. Uh, my name is Martha Staskis, I'm chair. Katie Gallagher is vice chair. Mary Cohen, Dana Allen, and Billy Bignor are all here. For those of you that have not met our planning director, Neil Leitner, um, and uh, he's not here tonight, but our zoning, a new zoning administrator is Mike Bishop. Those are very valuable resources um, that we have now, it's, and they've been a tremendous help to getting us to this point to tonight. Um, I'm gonna read the, form, the public hearing notice. We are here tonight to convene the second of two public hearings to obtain public feedback regarding proposed updated zoning bylaws. We refer to it as the Uniform Development Bylaws Phase 1 or UDB P Phase P1. Um, these bylaws supersede the town and village of Waterbury zoning regulations as amended through May 16, 2016. We refer to those as the 2016 zoning regulations. It's only in the downtown mixed use neighborhood campus commercial industrial residential one and conservation flood plain zoning districts that are depicted. You have oh, we'll get that later. That are depicted on the zoning district map. The zoning districts in phase one are bound to the south of I-89 north of the Winooski River and east and west by the town boundaries of Bolton and Middlesex. All other requirements of the 2016 zoning regulations with respect to the application processing, review procedures, including but not limited to the zoning permit issuance and design, conditional use, site plan, and subdivision review continue to apply, will continue to apply in the UDB P1 zoning districts. Any development, including the requiring site plan review, shall meet, in, shall meet in addition to section 301, the standards and requirements of these bylaws. These bylaws will supersede the interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district adopted uh, April 26, 2021. Um, for now, I'm missing part of my presentation. <laughs> this is the wrong document, but. Uh, well, so I'm just gonna wing it. Um, from this point. She's good. <laughs> from this point, um, we would like to know if there is anyone on the 
Zoom that uh, to provide your name, and then we will have that in the record. We have a, a sign-in sheet here. I don't know where to look. <laughs> this is the album. Hey, it's not working. Right oh, all right. Just look. Just look. I'm just gonna. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone that's on Zoom, we would ask that you announce your name so that we can add it to the sign-in sheet here at the uh, uh, steel room. Joan and Jeff Saban are here on Zoom. Thank you, Joan and Jeff Saban. Anyone else? I think you got me, but Danny Kelman here. Thank you, Danny. Hi. Is that it? Neil? Yep, that's it. Just two? Okay, thanks. Thank you all for signing in. Um, who's first? And Billy's. Billy's first? All right, we're going to refer to Billy. So uh, I wanted to go through just some lo logistics to, uh, for the meeting tonight, organizational matters. First of all, the Planning Commission is going to go through, as Martha said, a brief uh, introduction to give everybody and orient everybody as to where we are. If you want to comment, if you want to comment, obviously everybody signed up already. Um, if you're going to comment, um, we last time we had a podium and a mic. It didn't, we didn't really need it, but it just needs to be loud enough so we're recording. So if you could stand up so everybody could see and be loud enough, that would be great. We'll put some scrap paper here for people who are too shy to stand up in front of the cameras, just hand up a slip of paper. Um, and if anything comes up, uh, comes to mind after this meeting, um, if you would, you can send an email to Neil Leitner, N-L-E-I-T-N-E-R at waterburyvt.com. And Mike, you can, can you sign in, Mike? Team, Mike's, gonna sign in. <laughs> Mike's phone number is 802-244-1018. Just, just try and follow the rules. Um, next slide. So one of the things is if Unified Development Bylaws is a thick document, it's hard to absorb, it's hard to think about just in a public hearing. So there are plenty of online resources that we have had available for a while um, and I just want to remind you that they are there. I always find them by searching Waterbury VT UDP Phase 1, and it actually works, and then I get our page. Um, there's a lot of background up there. Martha talked a little bit about the process, but I just want to remind people we've used two expert consultants. We've had two open houses. We've got a lot of feedback from those open houses. We've got these materials that summarize different aspects of the zoning districts and the details. Um, we have consulted with the DRB along the way. Um, and so we've tried to keep this, and of course everybody's always invited to our meetings. So we've really tried to keep this an interactive process uh, as we're continuing to do that. Um, the m important document on the website is what we call the UDP phase one draft document. That is the draft of the bylaws right before the last public hearing. Right? We've not made any right. changes to that yet because we're taking the feedback. Right. We started our deliberations in terms of what we would do, but we wanted to sort of get this hearing in and then start thinking about how to put all of that together. Um, there's also a slider map, I think pretty cool map, showing you what the, the area that Martha just described. And as you slide back and forth, you can see what, what zones has changed. So if you were in a mixed use, or if you, were, if you were in village residential, you slide over and you might be in mixed use now. Or you might be, and you can see that to see how your zone has changed or anything. And then there are the story maps online. Um, the story lap, maps are electronic versions of these boards here, but one caution, we did those months ago. There are some tweaks to some of the details. Again, we're taking, so they're not exactly right, but you know, they're, 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 good, they're good resources, at least good enough for now. When in doubt, go to the UDP phase one document, look at that, and the simplest place to go is the appendix. When in doubt, ask. Oh, okay. I would sure. really, really just say, sure ask, because we are, this is a moving up, it's a live object. I would like to add to Billy's comment, the value I personally find in these storyboards is when um, the, the dimensional standards are, have been changed, they provide examples of what a zero setback looks like, what an 80% co block coverage looks like, what, you know, and that would give you, um, that's the value that I quite frankly see in, in these storyboards um, to the side. But thank you, Billy. Who's next? Me. 
next. They're next. Good. Yeah. Can I drive? Sure. It's just easier to get. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about geography uh, a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, to talk about this and for the benefit of the people at home, I'm going to use the cursor, so as long as you can all see a little mouse. Um, the top shows the town of Waterbury. In this uh, phase one update, we're not talking about the entire town. You'll notice down here it says phase one update and this little inset area. That's the area that we're primarily talking about. So essentially this downtown area um, south of the highway bounded by our town boundaries on either side and then by the river. So not the entire town. We are talking about generally this area. But keep in mind it also extends to the edges of the town. So that's phase one. Phase two is essentially the rest of the town. We're not talking about phase two right now. That's not, not in play yet. Um, so. Within that, we also have zoning districts. These zoning districts are important. These are where you find all of the um, permit and conditional uses. These are where you're going to find different dimensional standards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very important. This is the official map. Um, Billy did mention earlier the slider map that's on our uh, story map online. Some of those districts have been updated. When in doubt, this is the official map. This is on the website. So this print map is currently the most recent version. We actually put the date that it was created on there so you know when it was created. So just keep that in mind. The slider map is a really cool resource to see what the old zoning districts were and what they're going to be. It's not always accurate. Please reference this. Um, I just wanted to make that very clear. Um, and so that's primarily what we're talking about today is the, are these zoning districts. Um, Do you want to point them out? The district? Each one? I don't think we're going to go yeah. quite that into depth Sorry. at this that's point. Um, a note, this actually came up in our last meeting and we wanted to address this uh, a little bit. There are a number of different names for things in town. There are a number of different districts in town that are applicable in this situation. But we wanted to know that we're talking about zoning districts. There are other things. Um, there is a state designated downtown area. This is a state program. So that has nothing to do with zoning per se. We don't have control over state designated downtowns. There's also a historic downtown designation. There are actually three in Waterbury. So there's, um, what is it, Colbyville, uh, Mill Village, and then The Village which doesn't actually encompass all of what we all think of as the village, but that is the village historic district. That informs this process, but it's not controlled by this process. Zoning is separate from this. So, and then over all of this, we also have the uh, Edward Farrar Utility District, which used to be known as the village and is now known as EFUD. Um, and you can see that this is that dashed line here. So, um, we also have a, well, another district. But all of this to say that this is relatively complicated and that these three different designations are not zoning districts. They play into it in certain ways. They inform certain decisions, but they're not governed by zoning. So we just wanted to point that out and make that very clear. So I think that was somewhat confusing, and so we recognize that. Um, OK, to quickly talk about this, the background of the primary goals. Why are we doing this update? Um, we're trying to bring these bylaws in line with the 2018 town plan. Um, we're also trying to ensure compliance with recent state legislation, in particular Act 47, also known as the Housing Act. That changed a lot of things within the state. But primarily, a lot of what we're looking at is increasing housing density and availability. I think we all know why. Um, we're also trying to increase the mix of uses, including combined uses on the same parcel and even within the same building. Um, we want to encourage variety and diversity within the town. Um, that provides more opportunities for economic development, consistent with smart growth, so densification in these areas where we have goods and services in a walkable area, sewer service, things like that. And we're also trying to increase, increase flood resilience to the greatest degree possible. Um, we try to limit the number of zoning districts. Uh, there were quite a few before. And with the town and the former village coming together, we wanted to streamline the number of zoning districts versus what we had before. Um, we're trying to give people more space to build up and to build out, um, while also keeping a pedestrian-friendly community, acknowledging floodplain challenges, um, 
providing neighborhoods with opportunities for small commerce. I think that's really important in Vermont. Um, and also trying to provide the DRB, the much beleaguered DRB, with, clar with clarity and specificity. Um, that's something they've asked for. I think it's something that residents have asked for. So we're trying to get more clarity there. Um, highlighted revisions. We made a lot of changes to home occupations and our specific use standards, so that's something of note. Um, we're increasing building or structure heights, uh, primarily uh, in the downtown mixed use and campus, but really across the board, and so that's a big change within these zoning bylaws. Um, there are a number of changes to setbacks through all zoning districts within phase one. Um, we're also increasing lot allowances. We've moved to a system of lot coverage. Um, so basically building footprint plus any impervious surface is now deemed lot coverage. And so we're trying to expand that for people so that they can do more on their parcels. Um, we formalized the campus district that was formerly an overlay. Now it's an actual district on its own. Um, and so that actually allows more uses there, uh, including multifamily residential housing. Um, Act 47 introduced a lot of requirements, um, you know, including duplexes by right on residentially zoned properties, I believe only within sewer and water service. Katie, you're the expert on that. Or is it across the board? Uh, duplexes, sorry. Uh, anywhere. Anywhere, okay. Um, three to four unit homes in areas served by municipal water and sewer, um, and then five plus units per acre in areas served by municipal water and sewer. So remember, and refer our utility district is that sewer water service area, so that's applicable in that area. We're not talking about that entire area in this phase, but we are talking about it generally speaking. Um, and then one other large change is downtown mixed use zoning districts. Um, we're proposing no longer allowing single family dwellings in those areas to be built. Existing dwellings, single family dwellings, would be covered under a non conforming use statute, which is a fairly typical thing to do for districts where uses have changed over time and they're no longer a conforming use, but they still exist. So, um, this I think is really the, the meat and potatoes uh, if you're not a vegetarian, or the tofu and green beans if you are. Um, but this is the recommended review, um, the appendix use table. So there's a dimensional standards table and there's a use table. So if you want a quick reference, if you scroll to the back of the document, it shows you very quickly all of these districts and then all of the potential uses and what is permitted, what is conditional, and what is not permitted. Um, so permitted P, conditional C, X is not permitted. The dimensional standards will tell you how big things can get on any particular lot. Um, Note, uh, let's see, how do I move this out of the way here? Um, we'll move it somewhere else. Great. That's not where I want it at all, but. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Great. Uh, permitted use only requires zoning administrator review um, without DRB review, whereas conditional use requires a review and approval by the DRB within that zone. So that's an important distinction for that. And. Okay. That's me. I'm done. For now. For now. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about the, or I'm going to talk about the design review overlay district, which you can see outlined in the map behind me. This establishes specific building form, design standards, a higher level review for proposed development for those areas of Waterbury recognized as having particular historical, ar architectural, or cultural value. We, there is currently a downtown design review overlay, and the, um, we are expanding the boundaries. We're changing some of the requirements of a design review overlay district, and we're expanding the boundaries to include our proposed downtown boundary zoning district, our mixed use zoning district, and the campus zoning district in this part of town. So some of the things that I, I just want to read the purpose of, we refer to this sometimes <laughs> not lovingly as a drod, but um, we, 
are considering these areas to be important to protect and enhance architectural and historic resources, encourage consistently high standard of design and new construction, support and sustain pedestrian-oriented downtown, strengthen the community's vitality and historic function as a center for commerce, industry, government, and housing, and encourage new construction that will reinforce the qualities of the existing physical character while allowing freedom of expression compatible with the architectural vernacular of the community. This is the one section, and it is on in our um, most updated draft on page, starts on page 31, it's 16, section 1608. We have made updates to, if you have a paper copy or have only looked at this before the February 20th public hearing, it has been updated because Simply because we were working on it two days before that. So um, that's the one thing I would say. Make sure you have um, one way you can tell if you have the right thing is, is there's a significant um, list of requirements if you or someone wants to demolish an historic building. So that's. Before we go any further, can folks see where the district is on that? That's what I thought. No, I'm just going to outline it. So there's a red line on here, and it goes from the end of the mixed use, runs along Main Street, all the way up to uh, just before the railroad bridge, follows the mixed use up to the interstate, follows it down, you're going backwards. <laughs> I'm going this way. <laughs> follows it out to the end uh, on Route 2, and then comes back down along here, includes the compass, compass the campus. <laughs> Uh, and back to the end of this. I just want to make sure we all know where it is. It includes mixed use, campus, and the downtown districts. I was pretty sure I couldn't see it, so I didn't think yeah, I Yeah, no, no, it. thank you. So. Um, the important thing is that it's overlying those right. zoning districts, and the when we do have a, a statement in that section 1608, that makes clear if there is a discrepancy for some reason on someone's property between the base zoning district and the overlay district requirements, the more restrictive of the two applies. So that's just one other little piece. Ready? Ready. OK, so I'm going to um, talk about the our kind of vision for the different zoning districts briefly, because I think we'd like to stop talking at you quickly. Uh, but in general, note that we have, as was mentioned before, um, reduced the number of zoning districts in total. We've changed some of the names of uh, different zoning districts. We've updated some of the purpose statements. So I'm going to run through some of those purposes right now, just so we have kind of that overall context for what we're, we're talking about. But um, there are certainly lots of changes within each of those, those districts in terms of uses and dimensions and all of that. Um, so the first one here is the downtown. So we're looking at um, the red shaded area here. Um, and this, if you think about um, this phase one area as kind of wanting to have our concentrated core of housing and, and commercial services in this downtown area, this is where we have the highest buildings, our densest development, and then everything kind of um, trickles out from there. So our downtown area is where we have concentrated retail, service, office, housing, and other mixed uses um, in our historic downtown. And the intent is to maintain or enhance this traditional um, pattern of development to scale the pedestrian nature of the downtown. Um, and this, as Mary just mentioned, is also within the um, design review overlay district. So the next one is mixed use. So going out to either side of the downtown district, mixed use, if you can see, is kind of difficult here, but it's in orange. Thank you, Billy. Um, oh, yeah, you're doing it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I can't see yeah, Neil's doing it. So here we have um, still opportunities for housing and smaller scale commercial uses and other compatible uses in the mixed use area. And the intent of the mixed use district again is to um, because it's not that 
far off from our down from our you know kind of historic downtown core. Uh, this is still historic in nature, so we're continuing to really um, try to prioritize um, that village character and pattern and scale and pedestrian nature. Next one, please, is neighborhood, and so neighborhood kind of shoots off a little bit further. This is highlighted in yellow here. Um, but we still have access to infrastructure, water, wastewater services, transit. Um, so this is um, more focused on residential uses, um, but we also have some smaller scale commercial uh, opportunities for uh, these neighborhood areas. So think like home businesses. Um, and we're still you know, kind of within that really close proximity to the downtown core. Um, next one, please, Neil. So residential one gets much more, much less dense in terms of um, housing businesses. So um, this is providing for mostly residential uses in a rural setting. And the intent here is to accommodate housing um, that is also trying to minimize the impacts on the environmental quality. Um, if you can see, so this is our kind of teal color on the ends. A lot of that is in the floodplain already, so there's there's not really a whole lot of opportunity to develop there. But we want to, you know, there's obviously still homes that exist there. Uh, next one, please. This campus. So we're actually going back downtown here. Um, campus is um, where we have the state complex, um, but we have changed the name to this. We know that's a really kind of beautiful historic structure, um, and so the the purpose of this district is to protect and enhance that architectural um, and historic resources that we have there, while also allowing for some new uses, um, including uh, multifamily housing, if that were ever to come to be. But we also want to ensure um, that some of the features of that area are are maintained. Uh, next one, please. So commercial industrial, um, this is in the purple zone, so think about Pilgrim Park, but also we have these areas, again, kind of on either side of the, the mixed use sides of the downtown. Um, and so this is really focused on these larger um, commercial spaces um, that uh, are also, we're looking for opportunities for businesses to move in that need a bit more space um, and types of buildings that, that um, aren't necessarily, with the exception of our Pilgrim Park area in the downtown, um, need a little bit more kind of land and might have more impacts that wouldn't be as appropriate directly next to um, uh, denser residential spaces. Next one, please. So this is the last district. This is the newly named Conservation Floodplain Zoning District. Um, and if you can see on the map, it's uh, in green, light green, very much on the edges. And yeah, thanks, Renee, for pointing kind of behind where the campus area is and where we know the uh, floodplain is. And so the idea here is that we are protecting that land for both the environmental benefits, but also keeping it in an undeveloped state because it is the most vulnerable in terms of, of the environment, but also in terms of people who live there. But we will not allow people to live there in this in this proposed district. And right now, there all is, of, There is no residential car. Right, so all, so yes, don't worry. Of, all of the properties that are within this yeah. area are owned either by uh, utilities, right. the state, it's not, it's not right. land that is currently privately owned. Okay. Um, so that is it, and we will stop talking and we would welcome questions, <laughs> comments. Yes, please. Uh, Cheryl, I live here in the village. Um, so is this wrong now then that you're not going to allow uh, single family dwellings in the mixed use zoning district? This was on the leaflet. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you've changed that yes. from last. Okay. Not from last. 
from when those were updated. Sorry. Well, the last meeting. Yeah. Yeah. The last. This. These were here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, these are not. I know they were not when. Yeah. We, we have changed. We know. Them. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I have a couple questions, and then I just have a couple requests. So, what is the highest building currently in the village right now? It's the. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but during our deliberations, we did have um, some information from, I don't know if it was, I think it first was from our previous planning director, Steve Lott's speech, and we geared things to sort of match and not go way above the current height. Okay, so you're saying one of the buildings in the village now is 50 to 60 feet Correct. high? Correct. 40 to 50 feet. Well, yeah. So that the steeple's not the roof line, remember? That's an adornment yeah. on the roof oh, of the right. building. So we made sure and you can see well, around the steeple. Why don't you tell us what your point is? So my, my point is 60 feet is pretty high, yep. right? If you're going to the steeple, yep. a steeple's an adornment on a roof. You can see around a steeple. If you start building 60 feet buildings throughout the village. In um, the downtown. Well, and it makes it's only in the downtown. Downtown? Yeah. Only in the downtown. Right, but the village is also downtown, yes. correct? Yes. So this well, is it, well, hold on a second. When so you street, don't have a main street, the village is is your reference to all of main the downtown. Street. Okay. So main Street, so that's fine. Street. We're talking zoning no. districts, okay? Yeah, so the zoning district, the downtown zoning district. There you go. Is the only one in which 60 foot is the proposed Right. Building or structure height, correct? That's on Main Street, correct? That's correct. So we have that map that shows exactly where it is, but yes, yes. sections of Main Street up to the rail bridge down to Bachelor right. Street. So anywhere in that really. there's space that right. someone wants to put a six story mm -hmm. building. Six feet. As long as, they, as long as the design overlay district requirements are met. Okay. So that's my concern. If we're going to a steeple height, which we're thinking is the 50 or 60 foot height, that's pretty tall. Do you That's have a, a lot. recommendation? I do, actually. Um, I would recommend that we keep it at four stories and allow the opportunity to request a waiver from the DRB, which would give the DRB and the town latitude to look at the design, look at what the impact is going to be in the surrounding areas to the surrounding neighbors. I think that would allow us to maintain control on what's being developed, but still, you know, keep that density in there that we want to. I'm, you know, my concern is we start throwing up six-story buildings, and before you see it, you know it, you can't see the sky anymore. Um, Just one point of clarification: the yeah. story doesn't have dimensions, so we six-story buildings, so 60 feet. We do these dimensions in feet, so we're not okay. going to do them in stories because right. they don't typically have a dimension. So okay. four stories would be 48 feet typically, okay. and that's what we would. But adopt, not exactly. potentially. So I'm I'm gonna note that you said four stories, but then forty eight feet would be well I guess equally you know, acceptable. I, that's why I asked what the tallest actual building is in the yeah. I think it's zone just right asking now. us to all yeah. talk in feet. Okay, we're not yeah, talking that's in stories, okay. That, okay, so what's the highest you're, I, I, think in it's footage. Footage. Oh. I think it's it Over doesn't 50. matter. The recommendation you're objecting to is the fact that we've proposed it to be 60 feet. That's Correct. the point. Okay, that's the point okay. you want to make. No, they're yeah. taking input here. I, I realize that, but the, the mm -hmm. height of the buildings we did in feet as well. And even though some of the buildings may only be three, four stories, the height is close to 50. So we want to allow for a, you know somewhere in that range with knowing there are going to be design review criteria that has to be met. Right, and that's why I'm asking it to be lower because I, okay. I that's still fine. That's I hear you. Yeah, I just want to clarify. Yeah, it's think... not based on the steeples, it's based on the buildings. She said that too. That's all. Yeah. Sorry, I mentioned that. Yeah. And, well, all that's right. okay. Well, that's why I asked what, yeah. what we were considering to be yeah. the 50 feet. So I have a visual. Yeah. What's actually 50 feet right now? Very fair. Right? I, so that's what I was asking yeah, yeah. That okay. was my question. And I, so I okay, I tell you off the top of our head, but we did look at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, um, so I guess my question is, why did we think that 60 feet was a good height? Because, again, we're trying to increase density in the center of town. And so one way we can do that is by going up. And so we have this 
you know, we have an architectural mass in certain parts of town. We have access to water, sewer, etc. So that was the logic behind that. Okay. Um, and then I guess the other thing is another why question. Why was it decided that single family dwellings would not be good in the mixed use zone area? I mean, this. I think the we gave you the two yeah. zones are made sure. up of single family dwellings right now. Right. So the. Uh, one of the criteria that we have kept in mind at a very high level throughout all of these uh, deliberations and input is taking information with respect to housing, okay, and density. And the goal here is to bring us together in the downtown, in the, in, and so as, as Katie uh, nicely explained, you know, the most densest area, is a terrible thing. Um, it is. The densest area is the downtown, and then it, it sort of peters out, if you will, and, and expands that way. But again, the purpose is that, as, as Dana said, uh, occupying the lot coverage and going up, bringing it in where we need more housing, we need, and we were, so we're increasing the density by going, by expanding the lot coverage and going up. Can I, can I correct the record on one thing? Um, we picked 60 feet because that was in the interim bylaws. So we didn't actually go up any higher than was already passed in the interim bylaws. But that we did all, but we, okay, we're not here to deliver. Yeah, right 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 we want to hear other people's correct. comments too. Okay? All right, so I'm just so, gonna again recommend, yep. keep it in mind for uh, single families. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Roger Flav, uh, the village as well. Um, uh, I would second uh, what Cheryl just said, uh, and uh, I want to check with the fire chief. I'll do that uh, to see about our fire protection for a building that is uh, in excess of 50 feet. Um, I know it's a concern. Uh, he mentioned that uh, he might have to buy like a whole new. Uh, tower truck, which would be extremely expensive uh, for the town. Uh, so I'm just, I'm going to check with him uh, if that is a real concern with him. With him, I, I think it's going to impact uh, the select board's ability to approve that that condition. Um, and I also want to say that I have to go to a uh, recreation meeting now, so I'm sorry to miss the rest of this. But we've got an excellent representation here, so I'm sure I'll catch up on it. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Hi, I'm uh, Pete Martell, and um, I guess my questions are on the, the campus district uh, that's being formed. And I want to, I guess, third uh, Cheryl in the sense of the height, um, 60 feet. Now, probably, I think, probably the, the, the old hospital complex is, is pretty up there, as long as you look at the, the chimneys on that and all that. So, um, But a, a couple of my questions. One is, is the, the nightclub uh, permitted use, like, right from the get-go? Um, <laughs> As a, I'm going to butter to that, so that's obviously, you know, I have concerns about, about a nightclub just getting, you know, rubber stamped the way through. Um, and then the other thing being, uh, in the, in the floodplain, how does that exactly work? How the, right up there, yeah, thank you for putting that up there. Uh, how you have the, the floodplain, like, overlaying the actual campus, campus district and what, how that affects, you know, any reimbursements from FEMA and so on and so forth, that if it's codified in our bylaws that you can build there, but then does that reduce our, our FEMA reimbursement when it comes to flooding, which chances are, you know, probably won't be. So, sorry. So, so do you know, yeah, can you? You wanna, you wanna know how the flood, the FEMA requirements interact with the zoning or how our current floodplain regulations interact with this new yeah, with the, with the floodplain regulations, like what takes priority when, you know, you pass this rule over here and this rule over here and now you want to try to do something and which one both, takes precedence? Both apply. Yeah. Both apply. Equally. I mean, you can't build a building if you don't meet the flood hazard mm -hmm. requirements or if you don't meet the zoning requirements. Right. So the state has floating, floating, flow, floodplain, gosh, I'm on our time tonight floodplain regulations and you would have to go through the state regulations as well as go through the town for a zoning permit. And does that, so then does, do our rules then 
again, do they affect kind of the reimbursement rate? So if you pass rules that don't meet quite FEMA's requirements, does that kind of hinder us in the next time a flood happens in getting reimbursed from FEMA and so on and so forth? Yeah. Like the whole seven, is it 7%, 17%? Yeah, if you're talking about the community rating system, the yeah. CRS, yeah, yeah, no, this would not um, affect that. Um, what could affect it is if you did, if you were somehow able to build something that was not meeting the floodplain regulations that the state administers, which I don't see that That's, really, ha that could yeah. really happen. Um, so, but hypothetically, if something was built that did not meet the state's floodplain regulations, that would not be good for our community rating system, but in terms of the campus zoning district, that would not have an effect on our CRS. Yeah, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, so sorry, the, uh, the nightclub, the nightclub thing, I have some kind of issues with that. Yeah. Do you have a recommendation? For the nightclub? Well, well yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess my question would be is, yeah, I mean, no. to, to, uh, the purpose of a nightclub in that kind of historic area, I feel like is a little out of character, and I'm not sure how that was applied into the campus as opposed right. to say that. And I, have, I do have an answer for you on that, okay. in that like, I think that we tend to think of like nightclub in a colloquial sense, like laser lights and European people in yeah. tight yeah. silver shirts. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Speak for yourself. When, or, or however you think of nightclub. I don't know how you think of nightclub. Yeah. Um, that's how I think of nightclub. Um, however, in that same definition, it, it is under event facility as well. Um, and so the thinking there was that there could be a use of that space for as an event facility. So think things like Wedding reception. I, I you know, I see how the line is drawn from a convention to a yeah, exactly, party, and to a yeah. Party. Yeah. as well as um, within the specific or the the use standards, there is quite a bit of language. And if if, if you're interested, you should definitely look at this. But we did think about that in terms of soundproofing and like mm -hmm. external versus internal noise. Um, and so there is quite a bit of language on page twenty regarding that. Okay. So heard uh, as far as your reservations go, um, yeah. but there is nuance to it. Well, and I would add on to that. So the other part of the, it, there's uh, more parts to the piece, if you will, or pieces to the part in the sense that um, there's also lot coverage limitations. So the concept, I think, at least from my perspective, was to what if the state moves out and we have this empty building? again. <laughs> um, what could be used within the building without necessarily expanding the footprint? Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, you know, weddings or conventions or there's, there's an opportunity for large open spaces within the, within the building. Mm -hmm. We left the lot coverage at 60%. like 60 percent. So they, of the entire district. Of the, yeah, of the mm -hmm. whole district. So it's really not allowing for new structures. A, or a lot of new structures, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then um, I know that we were very thoughtful, uh, actually we talked about it a couple of times, as to protect the horseshoe and not seeing that split up um, because that can be a real community center gathering. So it's a good question um, and we should, well, it's written down. We will talk about it. Yeah, thank you. And thank, thank you. Thanks for bringing it here. This is hard work. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Kathy? Uh, Did you want you, you have to get on here? Say your name, I, oh, my name's Catherine Grace. I live on South Main Street. I just want to piggyback on him that when we have trouble with the noise down on South Main Street, we discover we don't have a noise ordinance in this town. So I, if you're going to allow nightclubs, that should be one of the things that should be addressed. Secondly, I had the pleasure this week of spending every single day on the phone trying to get a house insurance for my apartment houses. And the two big questions were, how far are you from your neighbor? And how far are you from a commercial building? Depending on how far you are from them, your rates go up. So when you're talking about, um, and I actually had to go to an insurance company outside Vermont to get that because I've had Horace Mann for years and they are no longer insuring commercial properties. 
So the, the, the being able, and how far are you from a fire hydrant? Those three things. Your neighbor, how far are you to a commercial building, and how close are you to a fire hydrant? So if you, I think you need to discuss that as a group and check on that because my insurance went from $700 to $1,600 on each house. And that's a lot. Thank you. And it's gonna be passed on to renters one more time in addition to the flood insurance which is going to be passed on to renters and there's only so much that we can uh, afford you know to do that and i also i hope you got the picture that i showed you of what a three foot distance looks like between the um reservoir and um sunflower there's no way a body could even get in between there to say anything about the damages so a zero setback in my opinion, and I'm hoping and finally make, getting to make that point, is just unacceptable. And there needs to be, in my opinion, six to 10. Or six is the minimum I would expect, and I wish it was more. Because if you multiply that space by three, it's still not very big. So. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. as well. Um, I have a quick question about workforce housing mm -hmm. and the zoning that we have here. I understand that we need to build up, um, but I'm asking also the question about um, zoning within maybe potentially like owning homes and small houses. Like can we and can we zone for even like the campus district, speaking of Stanley Wasson, yes, I'm a neighbor. <laughs> um, but is there a possibility, if we have to build there, can we build a small village of tiny homes? So instead of building apartments that are 600 to 900 to 1200 square feet for one or two, is there a possibility to build a village, you know, a small, where people can purchase a home, have that ownership, buy into the community of Waterbury versus renting an apartment. Um, I, I'm a big believer in community. We've been here a few years now and we want to see this place really thrive. And apartments are great, we love them. We want to see this like to grow, but we should do it sustainability. And I think there's ways where we can build these homes um, that are sustainable as well. And I will help do that. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to consider, like you, you, everyone wants to say no more single home housing, but can we start to think about the small homes too? We don't need to just build apartment buildings or multifamily homes. Do you have an example? Go ahead. I was just saying, do you know of examples that I have you could point plenty. us to? Or? Yes. Yeah. I will. Yeah. I'll send them. Send them That'd to you. Is, yeah. your, is your question about examples, Billy, of where that's being done or how it's being done? Well, where it's being done. Yeah, both. where? Okay. In, elsewhere in Vermont. Uh, not in Vermont specifically, uh, but in other communities around the country where it's been very successful. Um, there are rules and regulations, and some of these can be zoned where it's meant to say there's a deed restriction on it where it can only be sold to somebody else that is a community member or a workforce member. There's a way to do this. So I, I just ask that we don't restrict all of our zones to just apartments, that we do have some ownership in this community and people are there. Can I ask you two? Well, no, I just, no, you can ask for clarifying. I just wanted to ask an additional question. Go ahead. Or add something for you to look at. We do have um, part of our regulations on multi-family, multi-unit can apply to a collection of smaller. Right now, the number is 10. We've already discussed that that's too high. So we're, trust me, I, we've talked a lot about tiny homes and making sure that the small lots and the small so we're, we're still working on that, but we've, we, we haven't not discussed it. I, I, I understand that, but I hear a lot of no more single homes, no more single family homes. And I live in a community right now among Randall and Elm, and even on Union and other places where we have a lot of people that are 
up and coming and they want to have homes and they are starting to grow families and if you say no more then where do we go where does my child go when she wants to get married and have a family she's not going to come back oh. to waterbury what I'm saying is, uh, excuse me, can you just hold on? Please, please, please. Sorry, you need to just come up to the floor. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't get that. Just a second. Can you wait? You were interrupting. I'm trying to talk to Sorry. It's a weird thing. <laughs> this, the, the no single family, n no additional single families, mixed use and um, downtown. Correct. Not neighborhood, not residential one. Right. Okay. But I'm also looking at the open spaces in Waterbury Town and Village itself. We don't have a lot to do that with. Right. And if you look at the campus district, we do. If you're going to build on Stanley and Wasson Hall, you have an enormous amount of space to do a lot with. What you saying? And the so, whole house is on the campus. Just move up so they can hear you. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So yeah, actually, this is where the mic is. So. We have is this your mic? No. I, I, oh, I, I know. Somebody told me it was here. No. No, well, those are for us. Um, I am not proposing a development. No, no, no. <laughs> I am just saying what's well, not restricted. Right. That's all. Um, specifically on campus? No, anywhere. I mean, if you have a, a lot that could accommodate, you know, four to five small homes that an individual could purchase and have ownership in, why would you restrict that versus like building a larger apartment building that had four or five homes? Like, if you want to incorporate people that want to buy into this community, for sustainability, mm -hmm. then let's do this wise. You know, like let's look at the sustainability. Like, let's, if you keep building apartment buildings and that's all you want to build, then people are going to be transient. No one is so, going to stay for the long run. Yeah. And you can step into a position where you're saying, hey, buy into our community, be the first time homeowner. Those people are going to buy, the, buy my home that has three bedrooms. You know, and you can deed restrict that. It's been done in other communities. So, so I'm hearing that your recommendation is that you want our zoning to encourage more single, small single family homes versus necessarily encouraging apartment buildings. I am saying um, don't restrict it. Okay. okay. Not Thank encourage. You. I said do not restrict. Okay. And was there another recommendation specifically within within what you're, what you're speaking to? I would say that if you did want to make it sustainable, that there is a deed restriction on those smaller homes. So it wasn't just bought by a corporation or a person who is going to rent it. It has to be someone who is local and needs that home. Okay. Okay. You guys Thank all you. ready? Now I want to ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> you well, what intrigued me was you start, and maybe I just picked up on the wrong word, but you started your comment by saying workforce development, and mm -hmm. I'm not seeing what's the tie between the words workforce development and the single family. Is there a specific? So, if everyone keeps talking about affordable homes, okay. so who's the affordable buyer? Okay. All right. right. It, is this the nurse? Is this the teacher? Is this that that family who is starting out um, that wants to live in Waterbury, Vermont? That's what I'm looking at. Okay. I'm not looking at the person who needs an apartment. I'm looking at the person well, who needs. Well, the person that needs an apartment may also be part of the workforce development. Y yes. Okay. That's what I'm trying yes, to you're understand you're what you meant yes. by workforce development. Okay. Thank I apologize. You. Yes. Thank you. No, no, no. Go ahead. Thank you. So would your recommendation um, not restrict like a condo structure? Let's say you had a large building, but it was a condo structure, so it was individually owned. How would you want us to treat it, that? Sure. 
I think there needs to be a mixed use of, of house opportunities. I mean, if, if you look at it, who, what are you looking, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying, no, 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 and I appreciate your question. I'm, I'm not the expert in this, I've just done all the I, we were in the same position many years ago, trying to find a home. And we were lucky that we found one at rock bottom crisis, but we're still like trudging away, at, like fixing the plumbing that breaks every single day. You know, that, that's not the option that most people would take. Uh, so I think your point really here is home ownership versus renting. And yes, and you need and to be able to important. find that. That's important. Yep. Um, that's a good. You know, we're we're not just the community that yep. that is going to say let's just build and go. Yep. Like, that's good. Please keep keep in mind the people that want to stay here. You know, if they have an eighteen year old, you know, yeah. that wants yeah. that. So. Thank you. Thank you. No, and, and thank you for your time. Can I just amend my last comment? Sure. Okay. Have to go. I said I would accept a minimum of six. I'm wrong because I remember that my husband told me before I left. You can know propane tanks have to be ten foot from ten feet from a property line. You used to be able to put them anywhere and in an alleyway, and you can't do that anymore. So they have to be ten feet from a property line. So that's the minimum I would accept. Thank you. Hi, I just first thanks for last minute making zoom available I couldn't make it there and I thought I wasn't gonna be able to make it so I appreciate it. Um, I have not so much a recommendation but just a little bit of feedback to keep in mind which, um, you know, I don't want to sound as like a rebuttal but just another input so I'm a renter I am almost 40 years old and I've been a lifelong renter and I love renting and I never really have a desire to own a home. And that doesn't mean that I am, a, you know, like not bought into the community. I was an elected official. I work here and uh, Waterbury is the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. Um, so I, um, you know, there needs to be that mixed use and, and options for everybody, whether it's purchasing, whether it's a small home or a larger home or renting, um, condo style, whatever it is. But like, there are a lot of me's in our area and also in our country just in general. Um, and renting is a really important part of buy-in in our community. Just because you don't own property doesn't mean you don't have ownership here um, in our town, in our community, in our workforce, in our families. Um, I've been volunteering here for over a decade, um, you know, since I moved here. So for me, I really do appreciate the eye on renting, the shift into that availability of, um, you know, putting people in a place that works well for them on a smaller scale, which is, you know, I don't, I don't need a multi-bedroom home. I probably never will. Um, so I don't necessarily have a recommendation. I, I think it's important to keep everyone's perspective, including people who already own a home and may have one perspective, um, and then people who want to buy or want to rent. So I just appreciate the work you're doing, and I really appreciate the chance for all of us to to give perspective so you can use that as you move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Danny. Valerie Rogers, South Maine. I just want a clarification on, I can only concentrate on my zone, which is downtown South Main Street, correct? Um, so I own a single family home, my neighbor does. So in that region of South Main, can we sell and maintain it as a single? Yes. So I think for me, what stands out as the interim zoning laws, bylaws, and 51 South Main Street kind of set a precedent that I don't like. Um, the zero setback, the height, I don't think it fits in with South Main Street, the way I want Main Street to look. Um, so I'm really afraid that more of those will come along. So my, my clarification you gave me. More of 51 South Main? Right. Okay. I just want to make sure I got it. Right. Because I guess I'm afraid even if you, you know, amend these, there's a precedent now with 51 South Main Street. It doesn't look like a Main Street that I want. Um, I want single family homes, I want some, like what you're talking about in the beginning is actually just viability and economics for Main Street. I think when we all 
visit other towns, Woodstock, Stowe, it's beautiful to walk through the towns. We have some lovely signs out there, and I'm just wondering where, where the gateway district is, because there's a sign now that says there's a gateway district. That's um, a better question for Karen and Evan. And no, I'm just making a point yeah. that yeah. the districts are just crossing. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, get an information kiosk again. I think that Main Street, I hope it doesn't go to the point where it's zero setback. I think an another example would be in my own backyard, I think two and a half years ago, if someone wanted to put a garden shut up on my pro close to my property line, it would have to go through a permitting system. So I know that this is trying to make applicant easier for applicants mm -hmm. and easier for the zoning administrator to pass things without including neighbors. But now people get to put that garden shed wherever they want to. And I have to have a pretty big lot. So for me, these are all big things. That people now can put things wherever they want to without connecting with their neighbors as long as it can, it works with this. So, okay, so your recommendation is that you wouldn't support the elimination of single family dwellings in downtown? Right, but I think you or, just said that it's not. Or mixed use? So that- I would support, if you sell a single family home, that it can maintain a single family home. So, I think last time we were talking about how. No, so yeah. what the bylaws say, what, what is proposed right. is that new development of single family dwellings in downtown and mixed use districts would no longer be allowed. So new construction. So a new footprint by, the original. So that's a non-conforming use of an existing structure. So you're a single family dwelling within downtown and mixed use if this goes forward, right? You then become a non-conforming use. So you can maintain it as a single family dwelling. If you have changes and things like that, depending on the changes, that may require additional oversight or review. But no one is going to come to your home and say, this is no longer allowed, split it in two, tear it down, et cetera, right? So it continues throughout. However, if you were to split off part of your parcel and sell it, the only thing that someone would be able to do would be an allowable use. So that would be a duplex or a greater or another type of use mm -hmm. on the parcel, right? So that's how that would work. Does that make sense? It does. The other thing I'm gonna to add to what Dana just said is that anyone that is gonna make a change in the downtown mixed use and is in the design, uh, review, overlay. design yeah. review overlay district will go through the DRB. All right, and that means that the neighbors get noticed. And so, and to me, as you've said, I agree with you when you talk about, you know, I want to know what's going on or what's happening next door. That's your opportunity to continue to participate. Um, you would be noticed if they were going to put a shed there, and you can come to the DRB meeting and, and but I don't think they opinion. can put a shed up, though. What's that? They can put a shed up. As long no, as no, no. They have to come to the DRB and go through a design review overlay. That's one of the criteria. And so the DRB has the opportunity to say, you know, your neighbor is not happy about that. Can you okay. please move it back? All right. I did not understand that. Because when I was reading this downtown zone district. So, right. But see, you got to read it in whole. Okay, we were talking about this a little bit earlier about lock coverage versus permitted uses versus heights. It's also design review overlay. And while, and well, it, the, just a second, Mary. Yeah, um, the zoning districts dis address allowed and permitted and conditional uses, uses, and then design review overlay is the additional layer that gets to, uh, and in, in some cases, the use standards will, will dictate what um, is allowed for the performance, for the development standards, okay? Noise, landscaping, things like that. But the design review overlay is really designed to make sure that the character of our area remains, has, has some guidance. I'm gonna say it that way, because they go to the DRB. This is where we have spent time saying, you know, trying to pay attention to what the DRB, the DRB implements what the planning, the zoning, the zoning bylaws are, right? right? And so we really tried to focus on the design review to maintain our character elements. 
while in, in the zoning districts allowing more uses or permitting, you know, addressing the uses. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, kind of. I'm but sorry. I'm so, I'm not, no, I mean, I know this is meant to be easier than it was. Um, I'm not to less permitting, <laughs> less permitting, less admin involvement. But now it sounds like there's still going to be a lot of involvement if it's Simplified. Particularly in this area. I mean, you know, we do want community participation, if you will. Okay? And so that's, if it goes to downtown mixed use campus, it's going to go through design review, and then that notifies the neighbors of what's going on. With it, some so it doesn't exceptions. have to slip through. Yeah. With some exceptions, like your shed question. The, it's like over, it's over 500 meters. It's over 500 square feet. It's not any shed. So there, that is a slight change. But I, I just want to speak to the zero setbacks, because I've been a proponent of that, of reducing the setbacks. The built environment in especially the downtown even the proposed extended downtown boundaries are either already buildings right next to one another, or they're built as I, my home, your home, other homes that of uh, folks who are here, they're one side of the building is close to the property line, and then there's a whole driveway on the other side. And so there's not, this, but if I wanted to um, change something add a bump out or something on my, for a, a window with four, six, eight foot setbacks as they exist now, that would be a need of variance would have to go to the DRB as opposed to just putting in a new window that's not going to affect my neighbor mm -hmm. at all. So, so it's trying to find a balance between oversight, getting the DRB involved, making sure everybody understands and not have people having to needlessly go through the expense and the delay in whatever home improvements they want to make because of outdated setbacks that don't take into consideration the built environment as it exists. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, I mean, I, I could appreciate what you're yeah. saying. I think the historical value of 51 is not there. So I'm just wondering, you did talk about historical perspective. Mm -hmm. How do we maintain a little bit of that? I, like I said, I really think that 51 South Main, although I'm so for affordable housing, I think that is gonna be a nightmare for uh, multiple reasons, but that's not why I'm here tonight. But I just wanna make sure that that is not gonna be Main Street Waterbury, because- And I think some of our, our revisions, the, yes, the dimensional standards are currently in existence in the interim downtown, Zoning, but the current design review is not. So we're hope we we did have a lot of conversations yeah. about that building. What could we add that makes it look a little more like what we have without mm -hmm. hampering the ability for more housing? So we're, we we struggle. we are with you. I mean, you know, like I'll be honest. I made a personal pitch for looking at showing examples of housing, multifamily housing that's done in, in Morrisville and Hyde Park, and because I wasn't really particularly happy with the 51 <laughs> South Main either. Um, but again, I'm, we need more housing. And so it's, to me, the design review overlay district is really important and to strengthen that to try to maintain the character element of the, of the area while still bringing more people together and increasing our density and increasing our economic opportunities. I mean, you know, Stowe Street, the buildings are all touching each other. And yes, they're, you know, shops and businesses. And, you know, the opportunity to bring more small businesses into the downtown and be able to walk to them and utilize that kind of an, uh, built environment, as Mary's saying, that's what the balance that we have been struggling with um, for the whole last so year. It's beautiful, but I think Matt Main Street is not yep. at all. Yeah. So I think that there are maybe five homes on South Main Street that are occupied by owners. Right. Five on that whole Main Street. Right. You mean in, in your South Main South Main Street. I'm on South Main Street. On South Main Street. 
You're saying they're think, commercial? I'll say they're maybe owners, but they're renting. Right. I'm saying completely owner, owned by so, occupied, so is that owner, owner. Bad? I'm just gonna say that. I think it's good. It's good. Okay. I mean, it's sad that there's only five. That's right. That yeah. so many have sold to people out of town and they're renting them. Yeah, the and I just think it's pretty ugly down there. So, so I might have to talk to Neil. So, so we made <laughs> some changes here. We're yeah. just the word we were using. We're going to hobble out the town. You know, the statistics show we can't bring, you know, young families to town where we are. We can't, people are leaving, the kids go to college and they leave. We wind up with bringing in seniors that need support. So something's going to change. Well, I think that I'm making my input and when you talk about housing, you're making my input invalid. My input is about Main Street and how it looks. Yeah. And I don't like it to be the way it looks now and I don't want it to be wall to wall rentals. Okay. So, so okay. that's so, my input. Completely heard. Yeah, I think I think we heard, and we've talked about the design review overlay and how that affects character and aesthetics. I think we've heard your argument as far as character and aesthetics go. Um, this is really valuable for us to take under advisement as we finalize these. So, and I think, and you also mentioned setbacks. I think we captured that. Um, I think we are there. Are other things that we did not capture? No. Okay. For the clarification, I think. Okay. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. And you guys have worked really hard. I know you're volunteers, so. Well, Martha did. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's input, and I'm giving it to you. And I'm that's what we need. That's why I feel volunteering. I pay attention. I'm trying. Yeah, that's spot on. Yes, sir. So, I'm Mike Merchant. I live on North Main Street. So, am I correct that we had the zoning, and then I, being on 25 North Main, right across the street here, am I in the, the Town downtown development review section, the state historical downtown overlay <laughs> district, and the state downtown review section. Am I all three of those? You're really close. You're really close. You're all downtown this zoning wood district. Downtown zoning district. Zoning yes. district. Yes. You're in the designated down state designated downtown. Okay, it's not a zoning district. Okay. Is it development review. You're in the design review overlay district, which is <laughs> applicable, <laughs> which is applicable <laughs> to your zoning district. Okay. And then what historic. was it? Historic. I think you're in the historic yeah. district. Okay. So who has primacy? Because a lot of times they yes. conflict with each other. So I pay a permit fee for here. Then I pay a permit fee for here. I pay a permit fee for here. I've done it many times. <laughs> and, they, and, and they're all for the same thing. So who, who, pay who pay? I pay a permit process to the state, and I pay a permit process to the town what, so for review. For the yep. For, 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 for So when you build, if you want to, if you make modifications, you pay a fee for a permit for the state based on what you're doing. And the same thing, the, for the same thing for the town. You're talking about a building, a yeah, DFS yeah, building permit? What's that? A, a DFS permit, a building permit through the state? It's a for commercial, for commercial whatever, I don't know. I mean, I'm a, re a residential and I have some units. So but it's residential, you said. Yeah. Well, I'm residential, but I have, you, I have units, I have two apartments. So anyway, I'm just saying, who has primacy there when they're, when they're in conflict? So the zoning district, the town zoning district is going to drive Save that, okay. right? And, the, and in that zoning district review, site plan review, the, the design over, design review overlay <laughs> is going to apply, okay? okay? Yeah. The state, and in part of your permit that you get issued from the, the DRB is going to say you must, uh, you must comply with all other required state and local permits. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you need a wetland permit, like if you're building a residence that's, on, you know, you have to stay out of the wetland, that's a state Yeah, permit. yeah. No. Okay. I, I hope to stay out of the wetlands. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not but, I, but I think, if I could just clarify, Mike, yeah. you're, you're, um, when you said commercial, there is a fire marshal oh, oh, I know. Oh, maybe permit that kicks in. When you have Maybe that's more than, I mean, that's what 40, Act 47 changed, that duplexes don't require the fire marshal, but anything over that, I believe, would require so a fire marshal if you're renting. Mine is, yeah. Mine is, but, yeah. So my interest would be inside my house. So maybe I want to add one more unit. Say I want to add one more unit. 
The historical piece really doesn't come into play because it's inside. The developer review doesn't really come to play. I mean, I'll have to go through the process, but it's inside versus outside, correct? Right. So I'm just getting clear for kind of You're not changing pieces. the use. Right. right. Well, I'd be changing, well, and potentially, and we and we you'd be adding a unit, so even though I already have other units. Well, I, that's what Katie's saying. And you're increasing the number. We, we're, we're, we're not permitting that. You don't we're not discouraging you. We're not discouraging you. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah, yeah. sure. You're not, you're not impeding that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Okay, so I just want to make sure. So that all these DRV, all these reviews. I hear you. People don't really know. Once you go through a development review and you go through the permitting process, you think you've done everything you need to do. No. Then they tell you you don't. You're not doing everything you need to do. You're gonna go through this other development review. You, you're like, I already went through the development review. So you can see how it's complicated. It's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know who has primacy because sometimes it can flip. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. And thank you for all your hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Thank us. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good job, everybody. Have a good Thank you. We're all friends. We're all friends. Mike Bard, Mike Bard, Mike Bard here together. First of all, I want to really thank you for all the hard work that you guys have done. It's it's been a journey, and you've done really an excellent job. I'm glad that we've. We've gotten here after kind of in interim zoning, so I'm glad to see a final project. But I have three things that I want to address. One is uh, I heard a lot of comments about single family, multifamily, duplexes. I think we need all. The problem is I've been I've been in the housing industry, you know, for 40 years, dealing with single the, the whole gamut of housing. You're not going to get on Main Street. The house, the, the lots are just too valuable to put in a single family house. And if it's going to be a single family house, it's going to be a $700,000 single family house. So it's not going to address single affordable housing. Uh, I think there are options. They have the tiny homes and stuff like that. But the density you're probably going to have to look at is more going to reside outside of the village kind of limits. It's not going to be really there there are very few places maybe in the uh, you know the campus district but the problem is with anyone who's developing housing they're going to look at lar they're going to need larger densities to make the thing work i'm sorry we're not in communist china we're in a profit country and developers even the affordable housing developers you know i i used to be years ago on the board of downstream housing with central vermont community land trust and it was, you know, it's very expensive to build affordable housing. So it, it is, I would like to see a multi-level of housing built. Secondly, the 60, 60 foot limit. I share Roger Clapp's um, concern about fire equipment. Are we gonna have fire equipment that's gonna be able to serve that? I, I think maybe if we could look at, you know, we're at 48 to 50 feet now, can we look at like a similar size, which is gonna accommodate people who don't want, you know, really large houses, but it can go higher, because sometimes they have adornments that are gonna, you know, they're really not all that structural, you know, they may be cosmetic and stuff, and it's gonna throw it, you know, you know out of um, the consideration. And I think that that's just, you know, I, I don't know if, if that hard and fast 60 foot level is going to work, because I think a lot of people are going to be concerned about, you know, some people said six story housing. I still, even at 60 feet, I don't think you're going to see six story housing. You're probably going to see four, maybe a five story, story house, so it's not going to be significantly higher. And the biggest concern I, 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 I probably have, I know this is your first step, this is phase one, but I'm most concerned about what's, gonna, what's the next thing, the Route 100 corridor. That's kind of where we need a lot of work on some zoning restrictions, because I don't think any of us in town, or maybe some of us do, we don't want to see it become Williston Road, Shelburne Road. You know, and okay, it, but we're not here to talk about. I, this, I understand. So. Just, <laughs> just, making, just making a pitch. I think um, that's that's the next step. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So you have 
So first of all, I w we want to go on the record here that we invited the fire department, and we've not heard from them. So okay. I heard Roger's comment, and now your comment. Um, we've not heard from the fire department. Um, they should have commented. Yeah, we sh we would have appreciated that. Would have been great. Um, yeah. Secondly, so you said so with that in mind, okay. Mm -hmm. Your your you know the interim bylaws have sixty feet now. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. No, I I I a hundred percent know that. I Which just the select board approved. I I okay. Mean, <laughs> I just want to go. On. I understand, and I think it was after that. That's when the fire chief raised some concerns. But I think with the sixty foot, I think sometimes it's the you know when you have some of the accessory parts, the buildings that went over that you know forty eight foot level. I think that was where. The interim bylaws was going to allow those kind of things. You know, and, and my memory is, as I um, said in part earlier, we got information that the currently tallest building, not church right. spires, right. is 50 feet. So right. we didn't want, you know, and, and building codes change, building requirements. So exactly. we're not, as Dana said, we're not looking at stories. We're looking at height, and that would be the maximum. We would hate to, you know, put in a 50 or a 55 foot height, and somebody needs 56 for some legitimate reason, and make that complicated. Right. So we'll we'll take a look, and we'd love the to hear from the fire department. Well, you know, if we the need other a bigger thing, ladder truck. It's going to be a million dollar. No, we're not. We're, we're not, not trying, trying to, to that. make that. Yeah, we're not looking to do that. Yeah. I will say the other uh, element that I think got some of the board members comfortable with that height was the fact that we've also put in there, didn't we put in there language about promoting parking under on the ground? That, yes. yes. Okay, so, so if you start, we figured out. That includes. You know, so we started with 15 feet. We, we got some guidance on this, 15 feet for the parking, and then put the four stories above it, three to four stories, or, right. you know, so then you get up to 60 feet. And with the flooding that we've seen here lately, um, that was one of the ideas right. that we were trying to promote parking underneath. Right. And lastly, lastly, being a former DRB member, I think you've done a lot to create some consistency where they could bank their heads on things, which I think is really important to the DRB. To, to them not having to say, well, we have to approve it because we... we no, no, no. They came to one of our meetings. I know. It was extremely helpful. And, no, that, and one of the requests was to put 60-foot buildings in the neighborhood, which we chose not to do. So we've, yeah. we, we've gotten input all over the place. But, but Mike, um, the, mm -hmm. the question about, um, or the issue of height, I, I think I just, for the record, I think we've got to be sure that we're, we're talking about could be a storage, uh, you know, some parking storage, so parking underneath. Lot, right. Yeah, it's not that the living space is, right. so we're, we'll look and make sure that we haven't missed something there. And I think that's just where you should be looking to, you know, maybe. Why don't you have the fire department get a hold of us? <laughs> For my I, will, I, I will call Gary personally. Thank you. I just want our house with a hose. Yeah. <laughs> Gary will come talk to us. Yeah. The other Thank thing, you. it was earlier a mention about a waiver. We also were trying, you know, the thing, We've heard from the DRB, from Martha was on the DRB, from people who've staffed the DRB yep. for years, is variances and, wa and, and just from good plannings. Variance and waivers are, are not the way to go in, in a town unless you're... The old parking allocations I always thought were absolutely ridiculous. It was ridiculous. But what we've done All is right. we've, we've relied on conditional use review in places where exactly. we wanted the DRB right. to exercise some judgment. Right. Anyone else? Yes, please. Yeah, just one thought. Um, Chris Devoutish, um, I'm not super deep on the details of this. I'm here mostly to learn and listen, um, so thank you. Um, but one thought on the just building design standards, as it looks like the language is mostly around making sure it kind of conforms to the, to the area. I moved here from an area that had under, undergone explosive infill growth, which was great for a lot of reasons, but one of the negative um, aspects of it was you know if someone bought two lots next to each other that had two places and they put up five units in this place but they were all cookie cutter exactly alike and so you know whether you 
might just proactively include some sort of language around not just conforming, but diversity of design um, uh, designs so that you don't end up with some suburban cookie cutter six houses down Main Street. Was the, was the, that's a really good uh, 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 thought there. Was, uh, I'm kind of curious, was the concern because one entity bought multiple adjacent lots or? My concern wasn't that so much that that was a separate issue where they then turned into party but houses. That's but, how they but, made but it but yeah, so that okay. developer bought the two or three lots and right. they had one footprint that they knew how to build and they could buy the materials for. And so they put up eight, five, six, eight units in a row, and the only difference was that one had a square window in the in the right. peak and that one had a round window in the peak, and otherwise they're exactly the same. And it's just like it changed the character of the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, whereas if you'd have the same eight buildings, but they had different porches or different roof lines or different something so that it wasn't so Yeah, that's a good one, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, just new belt, late to the process. I'm just mostly learning and listening, but just just new belt. Uh, I'm late to the process and just kind of learning and going to read this this weekend. But how long are you accepting kind of emailed comments or? I know you're yeah. On. yeah. Okay. Um, we meet uh, on Monday, and then um, our goal is to wrap this up and give it to the select board. The select board will have to hold a public hearing, um, so we're getting close. Um, you know, don't All take, before don't take April 26th. <laughs> okay. Say the sooner the better. Yeah, that was AK, yeah. sooner the better. <laughs> we really do need to conclude our deliberations next week. Okay? Then I think we're done. There's no, nobody up there? Thank you for coming. Thanks appreciate for coming it. out. We appreciate it. Thank you.